Hello everyone, welcome back to the next of our full course lectures. So we're going to look here at IFRS 10 and IFRS 12. New standards, um, we're going to spend most of the time here looking at IFRS 10. So what are we talking about? What have these new standards come in for? Well, they're new standards on groups. So what they do is they replace the bit of IAS 27 that defines control and that says the disclosures that we require. It doesn't change how we do the consolidation in terms of the workings or anything like that. It's just related to how we define control. So it's a new standard on groups. The definition of control is going to be contained in IFRS 10 and that's what we're going to look at mostly. But we also need to think about IFRS 12 and it tells us that the judgments that management have made in their definition of control uh, must be disclosed. So they must disclose the reasons for their treatments that they have made under IFRS 10. So that's IFRS 12 and we're going to mention that as well. So what this means is compared to IAS 27 it may change the group structure. It may mean that entities that you thought you didn't control under IAS 27, you now do control under the new definition in IFRS 10. So what you need to do is know both. You'll need to know your IAS 27 requirements and your IFRS 10 requirements so that you can compare the two if necessary. Now this doesn't change the workings for our consolidation. Do be aware of that. It's not to do with the workings. We still add across the assets, etc, etc. But we may have a different categorization for different entities based on the new definition of control. So a couple of definitions that we need to be aware of in IFRS 10 before we go any further. First of all, an investor. So investor really replaces parent. So we're thinking here of a reporting entity that potentially controls one or more other entities. So really we're thinking the parent. So when we talk about the investor, we're going to talk about the parent company. That company that may or may not control other entities. The investee, on the other hand, is going to be the potential subsidiary. So the investee is the entity that we're looking at to try and decide, is it a subsidiary or is it not? So those are two definitions that we need to know. Investor is the parent, investee is the potential subsidiary. Now, control. The definition of control now is that an investor is exposed or has rights to variable returns from the investee. So that means that the parent is exposed or has rights to variable returns from the investee. For example, dividends, profit share, etc, etc. And secondly, they have the ability to affect those returns through power over the investee. So they have the ability to affect those returns through power over the investee. So that's the technical definition. Now what we need to do is we need to break that down and see exactly how we're going to decide whether an investor has control over an investee, i.e. is the investee a subsidiary or not. So let's look in detail at this control definition. Well, if you break it down, there's three requirements for this. So power over the investee, first of all. So that means that you have existing rights giving current ability to direct activity, which we're going to call relevant activities, that significantly affect returns. So that means we have existing rights giving current ability to direct activities. Those activities are called relevant activities. And that right, the fact that you direct those activities, can significantly affect the returns that you can generate. So we're going to break this down step by step shortly. That's the first requirement that we're going to have to break down. The second requirement is that we have to have exposure or rights to variable returns. So in return for the power that we've got, so we have the power to make decisions within the entity. And because of that power, that gives us exposure or rights to variable returns, be that dividends or whatever it happens to be. We'll look in detail at what that is.
Lastly then of the three requirements, we have to have the power to affect those returns. So do be aware we must have all three of these. So that's what control requires. We have to have power over the investee, which means we need to be able to direct activities that significantly affect returns. We also need to have exposure or rights to variable returns, and we need to have the power to affect those returns. So let's take those step by step. If you get a question in the exam, how are you going to approach it? So the three steps will be, number one, you need to see what the relevant activities are. Because remember, we have to have power to direct these activities. If you don't have power to direct these activities, you don't have control. So does the investor have a power to direct these activities? The relevant activities will be things like determining policy. So for example, if you had a majority on the board, you could direct policy. So that would be a relevant activity. Also, capital decisions, investment decisions. If you have power to direct those, that's going to be a relevant activity. Appointment of key staff. So again, that's another relevant activity. That's going to indicate that you potentially have control. Or managing investments. So all of those are relevant activities. We need to see, does the investor have power over those sorts of activities? So they must be relevant activities. And the next step is, do we have the power? So step two is, does the investor have power to direct those activities? So do they have power to direct those activities? So for example, you might have power to direct those activities through voting rights. So again, 50% or more of a shareholding will give you power to direct those activities. Also, potential voting rights, options. We'll talk about those shortly, but those might indicate that you have power to direct activities if you could exercise those options and therefore have more voting rights. If you had a contractual right to appoint key staff through some sort of contract, that again would indicate that you had power to direct activities. If you had decision-making rights, again, appointment to the board would indicate that you had decision-making rights. A majority of the board would give you power to direct those activities. Or if you had removal rights, so you had the right to remove key staff, again, that would indicate that you had power to direct activities. Remember, that they're the relevant activities that we identified in step one. So step one, Identify the relevant activities, for example, determining policy, capital decisions, appointing key staff. Step two, do we have power to direct those activities? How will we get that? Well, we'll get it through voting rights, potential voting rights, the right to appoint key staff, decision-making rights, or removal rights. The last step in determining control is, do we have the rights to variable returns? And this is key. It has to be the right to variable returns because the more power you have to direct activities will then potentially the more return you could generate. If you were just getting a fixed return, well then that would indicate that you don't have control. So the decisions that you make, the power that you have should give you the right to variable returns depending upon those decisions. So for example, the variable returns might be dividends, there might be, might be remuneration, or there may be some other type of variable return that you can receive. So to determine control, step one, identify the relevant activities. Step two, do you have power over those activities? And step three, do you have the right to variable returns based on the decisions that you make with that power? So what's the effect of all of this? Well, first of all, I want to look at the potential voting rights that we discussed. These are, for example, options. Remember we said that when we're deciding, do we have power to direct activities? Potential voting rights could indicate that we do have power. Well, what we need to do is we'll consider potential voting rights if it's practically, or if we have the practical ability to use them. So that would be indicated if they were currently exercisable. So if we could exercise options, for example, to get more shares, well then, that would indicate that we need to consider those potential voting rights. If they were options that couldn't be vested in the short term, 
well then maybe those don't indicate that, that we have power and we might not consider those when considering whether we have control. Do you also note that IFRS 10 means that if we have less than 50% shareholding, we may still have control of the entity. Now, it sets out the fact that we may still have control if we have less than 50% of the voting rights because, and only if, the rest of the votes are widely dispersed among others, i.e. they would have to coordinate their vote together to vote against us. So let's say we had 48% of an entity. We had 48% of the voting rights in an entity. All the rest of the shares were held by small shareholders. So for those small shareholders to vote against us, they'd all have to group together and decide to make that vote. That would indicate that we have control because it's highly unlikely that they could do that, that they would be able to coordinate the effort and vote against us. So if the rest of the votes are widely dispersed among other shareholders, it may indicate that if we have a high percentage holding, for example 48%, we have control. So that's a key point and a key issue to look at. So you'll also have to consider voting patterns when looking at that. Do the other investors tend to club together to group vote or not? If not, that's going to indicate that the potential parent could have control if they owned less than 50%. Other control indicators that we need to look for, uh, a contract directing voting rights. So if we had some sort of contract with another entity, for example, that we could tell them what to do with their voting rights, well, that would be a contractual right and that would indicate that perhaps we had control. Also, IFRS 10 indicates that if we have a power over a portion of a business, so we maybe have power over specific assets. Well, if we have power over a specific asset within a business, so we're the investor, we have power over a specific asset within another business, well, that can be called a deemed entity or a silo. And if we control and have power over that specific asset, well, then we'll consolidate that asset and bring it into our group accounts, even if it's not a whole subsidiary, even if it's just a specific asset that we have power over. IFRS 10 also mentions related parties acting as agents for the investor. So, for example, we have a related party and what they've done is they're going to vote based on how we tell them to vote. Well, that could indicate that the investor has control and they would have to consolidate the entity based on that. So if we have related parties acting as an agent, acting on behalf of the investor, well, that could give the investor control because they're telling that party what to do with their votes and that could indicate that they have power over the relevant activities as we've discussed. So that's IFRS 10. You need to go through the three-step process and you need to remember that if you have less than 50% of the votes, you may still have control because the rest of the votes may be held by small shareholders who wouldn't be grouping together to vote against you. So that may indicate that you have got control. Those are the key issues there in IFRS 10. Remember, IFRS 12 is related to disclosures. And really what we want to, to issue here is the judgments that we've made under IFRS 10. So we're going to let the users know how we decided which entities we control and which we don't. The objectives, of course, here are to disclose the risks. We want to disclose to the users what risks we have through our investments in other entities and the effect that those risks have on the financial position of the group. So what we need to do is disclose any judgments we made on whether or not to consolidate uh, under IFRS 10. And we also need to disclose any arrangement to provide financial support to a structured entity. So if we have some other arrangement whereby we need to provide a financial support to another structured entity, well, we need to disclose that to the shareholders as well. Because again, that's a potential risk to those investors. So that is our lecture on IFRS 10 and IFRS 12.
Make sure that you're able to apply those areas of IFRS 10 to determine whether or not an investor has control of an investee and should consolidate it as a subsidiary.